One key element of classroom management is this, establishing a culture for learning. Now, when we talk about establishing a culture for learning, there are two key elements we need to consider. One is student motivation, and the other is student engagement. If we look at how the Danielson framework describes student engagement, we see that the classroom culture should be a cognitively busy place characterized by shared belief in the importance of learning. As a teacher, we should convey high expectations for learning for all of our students and insist on hard work. We want our students to assume responsibility for high quality by initiating their own improvements, making revisions, adding detail, and or assisting peers in precise use of language. This would require us to communicate passion for the subject, to convey to our students the satisfaction that happens when we develop a deep understanding of complex content, it would also be manifest when students indicate through their own questions and comments a desire to better understand content. As practicum students and as student teachers, we should at least be striving to arrive at level three of student engagement, where the classroom culture is a place where learning is valued by all teachers and students. Also, there are high expectations for both learning and hard work. Our students should understand their role as learners and consistently expend effort to learn. And we will also be able to observe classroom interactions that support learning, hard work, and precise use of language. We're talking about motivation and engagement, two interrelated concepts. So let's use this example, the example of running the mile. I recently was at a school visiting, doing some work with some teachers and had a little bit of free time and I wanted to go visit the classes that I remember having the most fun in. So I was thinking about my electives, my art classes, uh, my woods class, uh, the ones that I self-selected. But I also remember having a lot of fun in PE because I was thinking about motivation and engagement. I want to go to the places where I feel like I was the most engaged. And so I went to go visit this physical education class and the kids were all lined up taking role in the gym. And then coach slash Mr. Schmidt said, all right, kids, today we're running the mile. And then many, if not all the kids were like, oh, and I turned to him and I said, now, wait, you didn't tell them before they were going to run the mile. And he said, no, the truth is we never tell them the day before they're going to run the mile. Now, why do you think that might be? So you can only imagine the excuses that would start to creep up for those who do not want to do it. Can't find my shoes. I can't find my gym shorts. Oh, I've got a stomachache. I've got to go home. Just not show up for school. Lots of things. So many of us have experienced something like this, maybe in physical education, but definitely in school. And so this helps us understand quite a bit more about engagement and motivation. Motivation is our internal drive for doing something. So if we're running the mile, it's what we have inside of us when we step on the track before we run the mile. Then there's engagement, and that is to what degree that we persist in difficult and challenging tasks. Motivation is the reason and the drive we have when we step on the track, but engagement is to what degree we persist in that difficult task. Now, what does that have to do with our students at school? Well, much of school is compulsory. You come because you have to, you are giving tasks, assessments, challenges that you don't want to do. They've been pre-selected for you. So we need to understand a little bit more about motivation and engagement. Motivation being that internal drive. Engagement being to what degree do we continue to face that challenge. Now remember, motivation itself is a meta concept. Many people talk about motivation, but they go about it using different terminology. So everyone seems to agree that it's important but it's a meta concept because there are so many interrelated concepts. Think about engagement, persistence, interest, self-efficacy, self-concept. All of these combine in this ephemeral way to, to form what we call motivation. That's why we looked at five contemporary theories side by side by side by side and tried to look at what are the key elements that they have in common. And when we look at them side by side by side by side by side, all five of them, we see that there's a lot of emphasis in, do kids expect to do well? Do they expect to be successful? And do they value the task? There's quite a bit about kids feeling like, okay, is this something that's changeable or is it a fixed ability or knowledge that I have? Or do I have the ability to change uh, my success in this? Kids' emotions that are attached to tasks, that comes into play. 
self-efficacy again. How do I feel about my ability to do this? But also keeping in mind that it's very specific to a task. It might be that I don't feel like I'm any good in PE, in physical education, but it might be in a particular context. Well, I, I love being in PE, but when it comes to particular things, running the mile, I don't feel like I'm likely to be successful. So remember that it's not just a kid is or is not motivated, or a kid is or is not engaged. It has much more to do with the specific task, the context, or whatever goal it is that they are working towards. We also need to understand that this controllability belief that does vary from individual to individual. So one approach to boosting student motivation and engagement isn't going to work for all of our students. It will take a variety of approaches. And also remember that we as humans love to determine our own destiny, right? So self-determination theory says, look, make sure you also keep in mind autonomy. We like to be in charge. Choice, I like to be able to make choices and our connections with other humans or human relationships. So the question becomes, what do we do with all that in mind? Okay, so if you look here, we can see different things that we could focus on to boost student motivation. We can work on their expectancy of success and to what degree they value a task. We can help them understand what is within their locus of control, what they can influence and change. Okay. We can understand that this is going to vary from individual to individual and start to provide them some autonomy, choice, and foster healthy human relationships in the classroom. So how do we do that, brothers and sisters? Now, think about it this way. We've got motivation, which is a key component of engagement. And one way to look at motivation is a combination of expectancy and value. That came up in a number of those theories that we looked at. So kiddos are constantly asking themselves in school, do I have the ability to do this? Do I expect to do well? And do I value this task that I'm being asked to do? That means that if I don't expect to do well, or if I don't value a task, guess what? I'm going to have low motivation. Or if one is high and the other is low, I'm still likely to have pretty low motivation. So if I expect to do well on something, I'm like, ah, I don't really see why we have to do this. It will go lower. Or if I'm like, I don't really think I'm going to do well on this. I wish I could. I do value it. I'm likely to have low motivation. Higher motivation tends to be the result of I expect to do well and I value the task. Kids are also thinking through this, what is the cost? So I might very well have high motivation, but I'm also wondering at what cost? What is the amount of effort that actually will be required for me to be successful? What am I gonna lose out on by doing this when it comes to other valued activities? And things like, you know, what is or are the negative psychological states that I'm gonna have to suffer from if I try this and then I fail? Or are my peers going to see me as a tryhard when I don't want them to think that I really value or, or really want to work hard in school? So they're considering what, at what cost would I complete this task in? So let's do this. Let's pretend that you are assigned to run the mile. You showed up for class today. Hey, we're meeting in the Hinkley, okay? And we go out back and I say, all right, we're going to run the mile. You're going to go out the back of the Hinkley and I have cones set up and you run all the way up the hill to that street that meets up at the temple, up around the BYU-Idaho sign, and then you come back, okay? And then you need to get back to the Hinkley. You're not allowed to stop, and your goal is to complete the course in less than five and a half minutes. It's about 0.7 miles. So you should be able to do it in about five and a half minutes. That puts you at a nine minute mile pace or six and two thirds miles per hour. Honestly, brothers and sisters, that's not really fast. That's just respectable. That's what we're going to do right now. And this is what we'd always say, before you go, I want you to assess to what degree do you value being able to run up and back and around in less than five and a half minutes. Everybody right now, think about what your score would be on a scale of negative five to five. If you could, now do the same thing with expectancy. What is your score, your expectancy of success? I expect to be able to do this in the allotted amount of time without walking to what degree on a scale of negative five to five. So what we've done in the past is we've actually done that pretest and then had people go out and run and then shown them the correlation between their combined score and how they actually did. And sure enough, 
value and expectancy tends to predict motivation as well as success on these types of tasks. And you can do the same thing in the classroom. Okay, I'm not saying you need to pre-assess every student for their value or their expectancy, but be aware that you have a kids who are all over the spectrum. So our goal is to figure out, you know, what can we do to boost a student's value of a task as well as their expectancy, their self-belief that they will be successful when they sit down to do a particular task. And the good news is there is plenty of research out there that talks about this. I think one of the best things we can do to increase value is work to increase students' perception of the relevance and value of what's being learned. Now we call this utility value, but for us as teachers, it means, well, we might consider spending time discussing or writing about the usefulness of what's actually being taught. So don't blaze through those essential questions. Don't blaze through those conversations about how we could actually use this or the examples you provide of different individuals of how they use this knowledge piece or these skills that we're working on. That needs to be a quick but very important part of the lesson, a regular part of what we do to increase the utility value. Also, we find that by allowing students to make choices or by us increasing the perception of choice, that boosts value. We value greatly the ability to make choices. For example, we might uh, offer a choice in how students approach a particular task or how they demonstrate mastery. You can do it this way or you can do it this way or, or a way that you can come up with that meets the criteria. You can offer a choice between this assignment or this assignment as long as it works towards the same learning objective. So either choice or the perception of choice. Now by the perception of choice, I don't want to manipulate kids, but I know this works well on me. My wife does this to myself and to my sons all the time. She'll say, guys, got our meal plan planned out this week, but I wonder what vegetable we should have tonight. Should we have broccoli or carrots? People are like, ah, oh, broccoli's disgusting. We're going to have carrots. She's like, all right, if that's what you choose. And she's done it to me before. Hey, honey, what do you think for our vegetable tonight? Should we have broccoli with cheese or without cheese? What do you think? I'm the man. Oh, thank you for letting me decide. With cheese. And all she is doing is offering the perception of choice or choice between two plausible options. We can do both of these often and repeatedly with our students. And I usually base that on past student projects or performances. Say, so here's some things we've done in the past. Both of them work towards the learning goal. Same success criteria, you choose which one. When kids get older, I start to offer up other choices. Like, if you'd like to do this in another way, then you just need to sit down and visit with me about how that will meet the criteria. If you have a student who you feel like just doesn't value education in general, think of it more as how can I help this student to value this particular task that we're working on now? Talk about the real world. Have them write and discuss why it might be useful. Because sometimes we say we don't care about anything and what, we, what we're really saying is I don't care about 90% of the stuff that goes on around here. But also offering choice, this might be a wonderful opportunity to pull a kid aside and say, hey, I'm talking to your other teachers, I know that you do really, really well in, in your arts class. And if you can come up with a way that you feel like meets the final project part of this assignment and the way you want to go, just let me know. I'd love to see what you're able to put together. It might also be, though, that we need to work on boosting that student or all of our students' expectancy. And this is a really important and challenging thing to do, where we go to attribution retraining or we start to work to change kiddos' cognitive perceptions of what we mean by success and failure. All of us need to work to change our mindset, including our students, that success is within our control. Some of us start to believe, I cannot be successful. It's out of my control. Also that difficulties aren't just brick walls that we hit up against, but they can be overcome. And so we have these types of conversations and we use this sort of dialogue with our students. All right, so I hear you saying you're stuck at this point. Let's see what we could do right now to get beyond this, that type of thing. And then also helping our students see really clearly the connection between their effort and the success that they have on tasks. So when kids are successful, you go back and visit with them or a group of students or the class and say, wow, this was really challenging to get it just at this level that we talked about in our criteria here. But we did it by following all these steps and being willing to go back and revise, making very, very clear, explicit that connection between success and their own effort. Not praising them for being smart and being awesome, but looking at the connection between these two, effort and success. Now, one framework you often hear a lot about is the growth mindset. The original framework, the true core framework says, we need to help students understand 
that intelligence is malleable, right? That we can actually grow and change our brains by learning and trying new things. And also that there's tremendous power in persistence in the use of strategies. So I'll use a quick example. My first teaching job was actually in reading intervention. And I started with seventh and eighth graders who had been pulled out of both of the electives that they had signed up for to spend an hour and a half in a reading intervention class with me. So you can only imagine their frustration of that. And the frustration they have in years of public school and feeling like that they are not good readers and sometimes being told, I am not a good reader. So that was one of the first conversations that we had was from the get-go, I said, look, if I were you guys and gals, I would not really want to be in this class. Sounds like you lost both of your electives. And I'm really sorry about that. But I, I'm telling you right now, no, the difference between someone who feels like they can read really well and someone who struggles, the only difference is that there are a few tricks that these people have learned how to do. And in this class, we're not going to waste your time. We're going to show you that by learning a few strategies and by putting those to work, we can actually change our ability. We can go from feeling like we're not a good reader to actually being very successful. And then I give examples of things that I've learned to do that I thought were hard in school and out of school and some things that I didn't do really well at. I tried and I wasn't successful and why that might be. I had them share examples, but it's helping them understand these two principles, right? That our intelligence is malleable, that we can grow and develop over time. And we do that by persisting and using specific strategies. One last element to consider is this. Remember, we also have to help mitigate this cost. Kiddos are asking themselves, okay, I'll, if I do this, at what cost? What do I miss out on? So one thing you can do, particularly with students who are associating with groups that aren't into school, right? So if I'm a kiddo and I identify with an underperforming group, teachers can and should provide opportunities to reflect on and write about what kids really value. So just allowing students to affirm their values by allowing space in your class to write about this, you are affirming that what they value is relevant. And there's less pushback in the brain for things that might not jive because they're school and not cool. Now you can also work on, this is really important, you can work on fostering students' sense of belonging in an academic setting. Many of us don't feel like we belong in a math class or in a group or in school. So what you have to do is provide what we call positive narratives of setbacks, talking through past experiences of overcoming setbacks. Also working very, very hard every single day to foster respectful, trusting relationships. That's relationships between the teacher and the student, also between the student and other students, and always helping students to feel connected and relating to school. So let's look at an example of what that might look like. I will not waste time. I will not waste time. Because it is too valuable. Because it is too valuable. And I am too precious and bright. And I am too precious and bright. I am somebody. 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 Stay right here. We say those every day because those are important words. They carry meaning for our community. You are somebody. You are somebody. Now let's represent that the rest of our day. In our classroom, we, we start every morning with uh, the I am somebody uh, call and response that is really intentional in saying that we're not going to let anybody define who we are. And too often, uh, people will look at our, our young people at Maxfield, make snap judgments, and try and define them. And so in our classroom, we really try and say that you are somebody important, and you can be the agent of change in your own life. Kevion, Talia, Destiny, your Sharpie marker of knowledge is going to be this one right here. It's been a really fun time. I've enjoyed being in Mr. Renash's class. Uh, we do a lot of activities that involve learning, but we do them like they they incorporate into our learning so that like it's not all just reading and doing boring stuff because it actually helps us focus better because we're not all tight and staying in our chairs all day. I see my classroom kids more than I see my daughters at, at home a lot of times and and that carries extra meaning for me because everything that I do and I want my young people to accomplish that I work with in school are the same exact things that I want for my own daughters as they go grow forward and, and to know that I play a role in that uh, however small it may be in the grand scheme of things is 
I can't really put that in, into words. And at the end of the day, if, if I can go to bed knowing that my kids have the hope and promise that education brings to them for their lives, I can sleep well at night. So overall, those are some key considerations when we look at student motivation from a variety of perspectives. So when we look more closely at attribution theory and social cognitive theory, we should wonder what are some ways that we can help with this element of emotion and how it impacts the degree to which students value a task. We should also wonder when it comes to student self-efficacy, what can we do to help our students anticipate success in tasks, contexts, and settings where typically they haven't experienced a lot of success. In other words, how do we take our students from this, this feeling of, I can't do this, to a stronger self of self-efficacy where they feel like, I really can do this? Well, one thing we can consider as educators is this. We can provide our students with inactive experiences. And these are the types of tasks and assignments that, when students successfully accomplish them, that they are capable of achievement on types of tasks such as what they're working on and in the domain, such as math, English language arts, history. We can also consider vicarious experiences. These involve modeling successful activities that are completed by others. The idea is that if I look at my peers and see that they are successful in their efforts, well, as a student, now I might be able to begin to see success as a potential outcome for me. Other suggestions for helping students move from this type of mindset to this type of mindset include verbal persuasion. And this is what we offer up in the form of encouragement, guidance, and positive feedback on student assignments. We also need to look for opportunities to provide mentoring or consistent, positive one-on-one -on -one interactions with our students. We should also keep in mind that student success is more impactful if it involves emotion or excitement. That's why it's important to do everything we can to tap into the affect, or in other words, the emotional investment that students can have in assignments. So when we go back to our different theories of motivation, we see this theory right here that's called self-determination theory. It's worth noting that self-determination theory places a very unique emphasis on human autonomy, choice, and human relationships. So let's take a closer look at each of these three components of motivation. So the truth is that one key way to support autonomy is to give students choice. For example, instead of assigning students to a specific book to read, Teachers can allow students to select from a reading list. Similarly, rather than have all students write an essay, teachers can offer them an opportunity to demonstrate their understanding through digital or other mediums as well. Teachers can also work to cultivate competence. We can do this by introducing activities that are what we call optimally challenging and by providing specific feedback. The type of feedback that we want to provide is non-critical feedback with information about how to master a task. Helping students develop competence involves us working with our students to determine what they will do, how they will do it, and how it will be meaningful to them. Another way to think about this is how can we help our students to own the material so that they want more? Each of these key elements, autonomy and competence, can be particularly important to adolescent learners who on occasion resist adults' attempts to influence their personal goals. And finally, we have relatedness. Relatedness refers to the desire we have to feel connected and cared for by others. So when our students feel a sense of social belonging at school, they develop more meaningful relationships with their fellow students. They also develop higher self-esteem and better academic performance, as well as improved well-being. So some examples of how to cultivate relatedness include using guided partner or group projects to help students feel connected to one another. We might also consider reducing the physical separation between us as the teacher and the students in the classroom. For example, some teachers have even removed their desk and instead structure their classroom in various shapes such as a U-shape so that they can move around and interact with the students more regularly. And according to self-determination theory, each of these elements, autonomy, competence, and relatedness are essential to student motivation. And when we look more closely at motivation as described through self-determination theory, we see that there are two different types of motivation, intrinsic motivation as well as extrinsic motivation. So let's talk a little bit about motivation in terms of intrinsic or extrinsic. Okay, intrinsic means it's coming from internal sources the pure enjoyment of a task or engagement. So for example, if I talk to my boys here at home, my own sons, I'm like, what should we do on this long weekend that's coming up? I say, well, it'd be really great if we could try and hike Table Rock. 
which is this monstrous mountain. It's awesome hike. And we'll do the long route and it's still kind of cold. So yeah, let's see if we can do it in the cold. And that would be awesome. We're going after it because of the pure enjoyment of the task. Okay. That's different from an extrinsic motivation such as you have to do this because, or we're going to incentivize you by paying you or giving you financial compensation, okay? We have motivation that comes from the inside and we have motivation that comes from the outside. And both of those are important. Despite what you might hear from some individuals, some teachers, some professors, we can't say, oh, I only focus on intrinsic motivation. I never want to extrinsically motivate my kids. We'll talk about why it's not okay to just seek to intrinsically motivate kids. Some kiddos aren't intrinsically motivated by particular tasks. So the only option at that point is to work with extrinsic motivation and then start to move them towards intrinsic motivation. So any effective teacher is going to use a balanced approach of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And so no matter what we're up to, you always see this need for some of this and some of this as well. And you also see individuals that might be experiencing the exact same activity, like take exercise. Some people are very intrinsically motivated by exercise, and some of us are only extrinsically motivated. Some of us are intrinsically motivated with certain types of exercise and only extrinsically motivated by, with, with other types. And so when we talk about extrinsic motivation, we're talking about what? Rewards, punishments, consequences. This has to do with not being interested in the activity for its own sake, but for possible gains. And these surround us. You'll see, see things like points, levels, badges, quests, leaderboards, prizes, money. I've talked before about the example of this, that we use a system of punishments in our house. We've talked about the intrinsic value and need to be kind in our words. We've, we've read in the words of James and the in the New Testament, but despite our best efforts to talk about the intrinsic reasons for having clean language and kind words, we're really just having the most success with our boys who are younger of saying, okay, when you use a mean word or a naughty word, you're putting money in the jar and we've got a leveling system. Some words are worth a quarter, some phrases and words are worth a dollar. And so you notice we're trying to do both. We're trying to work with the intrinsic reasons why this is a value but also using a system of extrinsic motivators when that's where our kids are at. Now, why do people worry so much about extrinsic motivation? Well, one reason is this. This is called the overjustification effect or attribution theory. And it states that intrinsic motivation may be decreased by extrinsic incentives. In other words, if a person is intrinsically motivated for something and you start to offer extrinsic incentives, that actually reduces their intrinsic motivation over time. In other words, rewarding people leads them to favor their behavior to the extrinsic reward rather than the intrinsic activity. So for example, let's do this. Angela really loves to write or to paint, okay? If her friends offer to pay her for writing essays or for her artwork, it's possible and very likely that her intrinsic motivation to do either will decrease because Angela might start to focus more on getting paid for writing or for her artwork than doing it out of pure joy. But the truth is that there is a tremendous difference between uh, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation at different age groups. Now let's take a look. If you've got itty bitty kids or kids in general, we find that children are more motivated extrinsically rather than focusing on the intrinsic part. Now kiddos do seek approval from teachers or peers so they won't be looked upon negatively, but they are largely influenced by their environment. So at this age, it's very difficult to talk about abstract notions of why we should value something intrinsically. That's very difficult to do. Not to say we don't or shouldn't do it, but we also need to understand that achievement rises faster with extrinsic motivation. So I can sit down with my itty bitties and talk about the intrinsic value of working hard to learn our times tables and things like this. And at some point a kid's going to say, but do we still get our stickers? Or do we get candy when we get them all crossed off? Because sometimes we need tangible evidence that we have reached our goal. So it's going to be a balanced approach of intrinsic conversations and fostering that, but also extrinsic rewards. When it comes to teens, there is still quite a bit of extrinsic motivation, but these kiddos are beginning to develop the need for intrinsic motivation and rewards. As they go through self-actualization, they figure out what it is that I really value and start to work harder towards those things. 
as adults, we tend to be much more intrinsically motivated, but external rewards when they're offered, and this is one of those times when external rewards can be offered, but it might actually decrease our intrinsic motivation for something. So for example, I love to run. I really love to run. I feel good about running. I enjoy it. Well, let's say this would never happen. Someone starts to pay me. You, we're now going to pay you to endorse our shoes and da, 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 da. It's possible that if I did it before because I loved it and now I'm being paid for it, it's, it's likely to decrease my intrinsic motivation. But there are some times where extrinsic motivation is absolutely necessary to what we have going on. So you think about something that you do right now only because you have to. You're really only doing it for a reward, to avoid a punishment, or to avoid a consequence. For example, think how many of you, brothers and sisters, are in a job right now that you really don't like, but you do it because you need the money. And that doesn't make it bad. That just means you're not at the point where you're intrinsically motivated. I just want to do a good job in everything I do, no matter what I'm doing. Well, it's a situation where extrinsic rewards are still necessary. So your kiddos developmentally will be at different places requiring us to use a balanced approach. One of my sister's teachers in high school, every time they got 100% on something, they got a sticker that they could put on the back of their ID card. And it sort of became like a competition just amongst the students to say, look at these amazing stickers that I have. Like, I'm going to try and get the same sticker that you have, all these kind of things. So it's something really simple and almost juvenile of just like a sticker, but it really motivated people to do better. And it also, I think increase their intrinsic motivation to say, I can do this to get 100%, like I can work hard, I can do this, even if it's just for a sticker, and then they have that um, good feeling inside of saying like, I can work hard and get 100% on my assignments just for a sticker.